Hello, welcome to the Ocean of Sound Summit. We have with us today, Eric Rankin. Welcome, Eric. Hi there, how are you? Fabulous, very excited for this interview. I wanna begin by introducing you. I wanna read your bio and um, then we'll begin from there. Eric Rankin, author, researcher, speaker, and lecturer. Eric is credited with discovering a significant and previously unknown connection between geometry and musical harmonics. His groundbreaking research, which he calls sonic geometry, suggests that not only is our geometric universe a symphonic system functioning in literally literal, easy for me to say, literal harmony with itself, but that this system may actually have been engineered by extraterrestrial beings. These findings take us back to an explosive moment in history when ancient Sumerians wrote that a technologically advanced race of sky people had provided them with codes and clues, which at some point in the future could potentially open up a channel of communication between our species. Eric's sonic geometry videos have been viewed millions of times and translated into numerous languages, while his research and findings have been featured on Gaia TV, History Channel's Ancient Aliens, as well as radio, television, and podcast interviews all over the world. Eric is a featured speaker at conventions such as Contact in the Desert, Portal to Ascension, and Disclosure Fest, and he is only he is the only regularly featured lecturer at the world famous Integratron in California's Mojave Desert. He currently sits on panels with some of today's most renowned researchers in the fields of physics, mathematics, human origins, and extraterrestrial contact. Mm -hmm. I'm very excited for this interview. Welcome, Eric, again. Uh, my background is in mathematics, and Manny's is in, um, as she is an engineer. We have both been students of uh, Sufism and of the teachings of Ibn Arabi. I'm not sure if you're familiar with those, uh, but all of his teachings on sound, the emanation of consciousness and creation and that. And there's a lot of overlap, I think, for us to explore. And hopefully we'll all learn a lot from each other in this process as well. Sounds great. So, Amani, I want to, um, uh, Amani is going to begin. Let me introduce Amani. She's a... Uh, uh, from Egypt. She has a master's in comparative philosophy of religions. She's has her postgraduate degree in Islamic studies and Sufism. She did her doctoral um, or her, her dissertation on Ibn Arabi. She served as a translator for my spiritual teacher for the last 12 years of his life. And she's a founder of Universal Chaplaincy. And she is my co-teacher in our program called the Ocean of Sound, where we get to explore um, all of the mysteries hidden within our, the sacred sounds that make up our creation. So welcome, Amani. And Thank, I'll let you, you begin. Thank you, Mastur. Thank you, Mastura, for the introduction. Great to have you, Eric, with us here. Thank uh, you. We're very excited. And um, I'm really very curious about what triggered your interest in sonic geometry. If you can share your story a little bit with audience. Sure. Um, my interest with frequencies started, I grew up in the yachting industry, uh, selling and skippering boats here in Southern California. And I spent so much time out on the water and really started interacting with dolphins. Uh, first, you notice that dolphins like to ride the bow wave of a boat, the pressure wave, uh, surfing it. And when the boat, either they get tired of it or the boat stops, they usually just go away. But I started going in the water with dolphins and feeling this ultrasonic pulsations that they emit. And I became fascinated with the, the species and their behavior and their biology, physiology. I started reading books by some of the experts in dolphin research, primarily John Lilly in the 50s and 60s. He made some major discoveries about dolphins and how they live. He's the inventor of the sensory deprivation tank. And he did that to wonder what a complex mind, actually more complex than ours, does in a very low stimulus environment. Mm. He became uh, he he came under the idea that uh, dolphins might be living in a, a structural world of sound that they are able to not only pulse out high frequencies like a bat uses radar, dolphins ultrasound, and they get this ping back. But it's much more advanced than that, that they can literally see inside each other in the exact same way 
we use ultrasound and medical devices to look into the womb and see a fetus. That's dolphin technology. That's where we got that idea from. Mm -hmm. uh, and in my book, The Aquarians, which was all about dolphins, I, it's a novel, but I incorporated as much factual information as I could. There's a lot of studies where dolphins, the reason that they have such big brains and high storage capacity is the same reason our computers need such high storage capacity. It's not for simple information, it's for complex visual digital information. So the theory is that now dolphins and whales might be possible of once they send a pulse at something, what they receive back is a visual image and now that's known. The second part of that, which is a bit of a mystery, but seems to be coming true more and more, is that they can store those codes of what they see and retransmit those to others. And more or less, you have a non-degrading digital file loaded with information uh, that could potentially be millions of years old because dolphins have been on this planet looking like they look like for at least 50 million years. Uh, so we may someday have 50 million years worth of, of visual records of what dolphins have seen in the water, which would include our evolution because humans have gone in the water, you know, swimming and in the water. So dolphins would have a record of us as well. Um, and that's what sparked my, inter it, uh, my interest was frequency. And mm -hmm. after that, uh, I was led to this place called the Integratron, which is kind of a frequency machine, supposedly built with the assistance and guidance of extraterrestrials by an aeronautical engineer, not a crackpot, he worked at Hughes uh, Aviation. He worked with Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes actually funded about a quarter to a third of the building of the Integratron. And I started going there just to experience what frequency does in this beautiful wooden uh, dome. It's called the world's most perfectly acoustic wooden dome. Uh, and I started experimenting with frequencies and just kind of blindly toying around thinking that certain resonances, and they do, every building, every structure has its resonant frequency. Um, but then bits of information started coming through that I did not put together. And then one day uh, I was at my office and this is where sonic geometry totally launched. I literally heard a voice sounded like inside my head, instructing me to go to my conference room to my whiteboard and draw a triangle. And I did that. And I, um, I said, I have no idea what I'm doing or who I'm listening to, but I drew a triangle. And then this voice said, well, okay, that's great. Now uh, make note of its sum total of its three sides, its three angles. And I'm like, I failed geometry in high school and never took math again in college. So I'm like, uh, I'll have to look that up, but a triangle is always 180 degrees. If it has three angles, it's always 180 degrees. And I did that. And then lastly, I said, play that as a tone. And I'm like, play that as a tone. How would I do that? But, you know, 50, not even 50, 20 years ago, so acoustic engineers, like testing speakers and frequency devices, would have to buy a specific piece of equipment to create tone, generate, uh, generate sine wave tones, perfect tones. But we all have this, you know, this... Uh, I downloaded an app. That <laughs> available to us in our smartphones. Yes. So I downloaded a, an app, a tone generating app. I played 180 cycles per second. So I hear this tone and I have a, a, a chime set so you can hear a little clearly, but here's 180 cycles per second. I'm like, that must be it. I don't know why I did those three things, but there it was. And I was like, no, you're just getting started. We're gonna move through all the, the elemental geometric shapes. So, I'm like, and they said, what is next? And I guess, well, I guess it's a square or a circle, you know? And they said, yes, what is a square's sum total? So I did 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees. And that was, which is exactly double of that. And I'm like, oh, that's an octave. I'm a musician. I play piano in a band I have my whole life. And I go, that's a interesting thing that the musical interval is an octave. And they said, what's next? Oh, well, that's a pentagon. And a pentagon is this. And I instantly recognize that interval as a first and a fifth, which is the most common interval in Western music 
it is how Western music tuning is. It's called the circle of fifths. But here we have. I'm like, wow, that's interesting. And it's like, well, what's next? And then it was a hexagon. That was another octave higher of the first shape. So there was that. And then when I got to a septagon, seven sides, it provided an octave of this tone. And that's a third. And these are mathematically perfect ratios. These aren't how music is tuned. When we start fine tuning music on a, on a piano or anything, we call it equal temperament. And it's kind of fudged a lot. It's a lot of decimal points and near misses, but it's not mathematically perfect. But when you play either the, the first, the triangle, and then the square, and then the pentagon, and now the septagon, seven sides, it's the third. So now, basic geometry, the primary shapes are either the first, the third, and the fifth, which is the most beautiful form of music that when we hear that chord, a major chord, something inside of us tells us, oh, everything's right. It's angels singing. It's, it's the king and queen you know, getting together. It's the war being won. It, it's an affirmation to us that everything is right. And I'm like, wow, this is amazing that geometry is revealing this major chord. So I rushed to my computer, my laptop, and I Google searched, this is now going back to 2012, so just over 10 years ago in August. And I typed in any combination of geometry revealing major chord harmonics or inverted or any of that, zero. And I was actually quite surprised and as I started doing more research and I made all the notations about this and sent it to some of my music theory friends, they said, you, you discovered something that had not been discovered yet. And I go, that's impossible. But uh, now that's what's my entry, why I get invited to these conferences or Ancient Aliens or Gaia, uh, Gaia TV is this for primarily this one major discovery. It's led to others but there's something so significant in this primary essence. So I started, and I'm not sounding very conversational. Maybe I'll stop here in case you have a question. <laughs> of course, it generates a lot of questions. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, first, you said the dolphins send uh, a bowls. Do they send, is it like an electromagnetic bowls? It's a, curious. no, it's not electromagnetic. It is, Pure, pure wave form. So they have the capability of creating in the melon. So a dolphin, unless you saw the skeleton of a dolphin, you would think it has this bulbous skeleton, but it does not. It looks like a bird. That big bulb is what's called the melon. And it's this gelatinous sac that they can emit pulses in their skull focus. They can compress this sac of fluid and emit the frequencies out through that in a very targeted way. And then they receive the information back in their lower jaw and the signal goes up to their brain as an image. Um, and it's super, super sensitive. They can tell a, a dime from a penny at a uh, hundred yards away kind of thing. So it's super delicately sensitive and that's it, but it is actual vibratory, not electromagnetic. It is vibratory sound waves. That's so cool. And I wonder, as you're receiving this information, is this dolphins communicating with you and you've spent so much time with them and saying, hey, we're going to we're going to help this, this guy help the people. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, you know? you know, I never got any sort of information. It didn't feel like from a dolphin, like a telepathic message or something. But if you're in the water along enough with different dolphins of different species, you realize that your physiology is being affected by them. That when mm -hmm. you are blasted with these range of frequencies, you almost feel like you're being electrocuted. And sometimes the tingling can last for days and even weeks. My first interaction with a dolphin in Florida, um, that sensation lasted uh, a couple of weeks. And I was just buzzing, uh, just inside out. Like every cell inside of me was, was vibrating and buzzing. Ooh. that's that to me is beautiful and i know you know in my um uh spiritual journey that i have had that kind of experience in meditation where information is you know it, it feels like it's transmitted through vibratory 
messages. So yeah. why not, right? Um, I would definitely say that my experience with the dolphins has somehow opened a certain receptor to me because I am the last guy that should be talking about physics and geometry and all of that, ancient cultures and uh, technology. And yet I somehow was capable of, of putting these, these different factors together and seeing something really, really big and really meaningful. And, it, and it's a, a door, once the door is opened uh, and you go down the rabbit hole, it doesn't stop. And other people, you see other people are contributing to this field of work where it's kind of about number sequences. You're a mathematician, it sounds like. It's not necessarily math, although if you have a higher functioning brain than mine, um, there's people using this information and they are seeing how it connects to phi ratio and ratios and Fibonacci and pineal patterning, it's all connected and held in this with these same numerics. That's the mm -hmm. crazy thing. And so uh, the, the information that I revealed in both Sonic Geometry 1 and 2, the it's tons of information. And it's something that people can pick apart and see that it's 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 like gears in a finely machine, machined watch or clock. The, everything, you don't have to say, isn't this interesting how close or similar? This is mechanically perfect gearing. And the other aspect of it, because these number sequences that reveal this have been with us since Sumerian times, roughly 6,000 years ago, 4,000 BC that we got a, a particular counting system re revealing sexagesimal math uh, from the Sumerians. We got these number sequences like 432 and 108 and 216, uh, 144, 72, that became significant in religious studies and spiritual practices, but they were grounded there without what do they mean? Well, we not, might not know what they mean, but there's people like Graham Hancock. Let's take one guy. He, he, I don't think he's the person who discovered this, but the number 432 or just the number sequence, no matter if it has decimal points or zeros behind it, the number sequence of 432. And he discovered that the Great Pyramid of Giza, if you take its circumference, its four sides and multiply that length, you don't have to call it inches or feet or anything, multiply that times 43,200, you get the circumference of our planet. If you multiply the base, Time to the apex of the Great Pyramid of Giza and multiply that by the same number, 43,200, you get from dead center of our Earth to the North Pole. So now we're not just talking about interesting information to play with and decipher and tease out. You are really being reminded of that someone or an intelligence of some sort knew this, wrote these number sequences down or implanted us with these number sequences waiting almost for us to see how they are being revealed. But it wasn't until we could know how the exact circumference of our planet or the diameter of the sun or the moon, could we see this precise number sequences repeated over and over and over again. So that's why it never stops. We're just, we're just scratching the surface of what all this information really means. Mm. It, it seems to me that the two ways of, by which we receive knowledge, trial and error and experiment, but also through inspiration. Yeah. And in, in our past, and I think in many religions, uh, this extraterrestrial can be called those different names, angels, we have also jinn in, in Islamic Sufism, we believe there is invisible creature like the angels and the jinn that uh, may communicate with some people and bring this uh, kind of knowledge or inspiration to them. So uh, is that is like a thread you found common in all ancient culture as well? Uh, yeah, and you know, I like to uh, expand it or at least incorporate a more of a science into it as well. These myths, like Joseph Campbell, these spirits, spiritual teachings, religious teachings, and myth happen to reveal a lot of these similar ideas. But let's look at a guy like Nikola Tesla. We are living in Nikola Tesla's world of electronics, whether how we generate electricity, how it's sent, and how it's used, and the motors that use them. 
That's all Tesla, how, how that happened. To create that first dynamo, when we think of the invention process, trial and error, Thomas Edison and the light bulb, took him 500 tries to get the filament right and the vacuum right and the heat right and the and containment bulb correct. And, and with, but with Nikola Tesla, a much more complicated machine, the dynamo, he saw it in his mind. He said he was receiving it from somewhere outside of himself. He could look at this device, spin it around in 3D, and when he made the first one, it worked perfectly. And he says there is, he even said extraterrestrial, somewhere there is a intelligence that is sending information to us. So you know, whether we want to believe that or not and say it's ridiculous to think about extraterrestrials, we're living in um, you know, Nikola Tesla's world of electricity, and he said he got that from extraterrestrials. So like it or not, we're kind of living in that world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well there's definitely an intelligence beyond ourselves and yes. we're you know we are are in on our good days yeah. i believe tapped into an intelligent larger than ourselves that can can inspire through us and you know end up with as some uh manifestation in this 3d material realm that we live in that we experience through our bodies um and i think you know that it comes from beyond ourselves. Can I ask about the number 432? Sure. Because that seems to be a, a like a, a cornerstone of information in terms I agree. of frequency, right? So yes. can how did you derive Ooh. at the 432? How did that come through for you? So the way it came through for me was probably different than other people, but that very first day that I was there in my conference room on the whiteboard, I started making notes of some of these, first the primary geometric shapes, and then I took it up to uh, platonic solids, and then I took it to sacred geometry, the flower of life. And I realized that same chord and those same number sequences, same tones were held in all this, whether it's 2D, 3D, or even sacred geometry. And I realized that all the number totals totaled nine. 180 degrees of triangle, one and eight is nine. Uh, and, and so I started seeing some numbers and I figured, could I build a tuning scale from just these three tones that I got, the F sharp, A sharp, C sharp. And sure enough, if I moved by factors of nine, I came up with not a 12 tone scale, but a 14 tone scale. And so as I moved down, there became the number 27. That was the very first row of numbers. And 27 octave up is 54. Octave up, same tone, just higher octave is 108, then 216, then doubled again is 432. And I knew all those numbers. I already knew that 108 was the number of beads in a mala necklace. And I'm like, that's an interesting synchronicity. A lot of people are familiar with Buddha, the naked Buddha, the not the big Buddha, but the laughing Buddha, but the, the fit meditating Buddha. And a lot of people think he has curly hair. Those aren't curls on his head of hair. Those are snails that supposedly in the myth rose up his back as he was meditating in the hot sun and 108 gathered on the top of his head, exactly 108. So this Joseph Campbell, who came up with the idea of the hero's journey, he also came to realize as he traveled the world studying myth and religious teachings, that there was such a thing as mathematical mythology, that there was number sequences held in many stories. In fact, in Hinduism, uh, or when you talk about jinns, there's a famous battle between like 72 jinns and 72 saints. But you can go to Judaism and find 72 names of God. You can go to the Quran and there's 72 virgins waiting for martyrs. I mean, 72 is a number embedded in virtually every major religion. And we were like, for what purpose? And usually you don't get past the question. It's just like, it's just there. And now it's important to us. But why was why is that number found in every religion? 144, 12 squared. We have 144,000 chosen ones, you know, in, in Christianity, in the book of Revelations. There was 144,000 smooth white limestones that covered the Great Pyramid of Giza. 
There's 144,000 days in the Mayan timekeeping cycle called, uh, cycle called the Bactun. Once again, we see these mythological numbers becoming significant in other measuring systems. And that's where it just keeps flowering out and infinitely expansive. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a very interesting, uh, you know, when I think of angels, for example, uh, we in our past, we believe Prophet Muhammad said, والسلام, he said that angels made of light, and if you think of light, it's electromagnetic or part of a spectrum called the electromagnetic. We only can perceive a visible aspect of it. Yeah. So angels can be uh, like that, and they are the medium of uh, bringing knowledge from the unseen world to uh, the prophets or messengers of God, and then to also regular humans, what we call inspiration. Yes. And um, numbers are significant in, in, in many uh, religious uh, texts. Uh, I think in, in Islam, the 72 uh, version is like a, not very popular, it's not in the Quran itself, it's in what we call Hadith. And the hadith uh, that speaks about the 72 version, which some Muslim extremists believe in, it's actually not very authentic hadith. But the 72 number is still authentic, it's still significant in Islam because the Prophet Muhammad, uh, والسلام, he said that the Muslims, like uh, Christian and Jewish people, will be divided into 72, 73, 6. 72 or among those will be wrong and only one will be on the right uh, path. So, uh, and there is also the battle between uh, al Hussein, which he was the grandchild of Prophet Muhammad. Uh, he had this uh, battle with, uh, let us say, forces of evil. And uh, there was 72 martyrs in that battle. So it's kind of, uh, I can see the, the commonality of how significant certain numbers repeated in certain uh, religious and ancient texts. And uh, so these numbers, what you are saying is connected to the sacred geometry or the fabric, the invisible fabric of the universe. Like it carries meanings uh, to us uh, so this meanings like how how can it benefit us in our daily life like these numbers and sacred geometry for the regular audience like okay what does this mean to me can you elaborate a little bit on that well i think the first people it will mean something to will be advanced researchers um, that they will get affirmations because, you know, there are still things, of course, that we don't understand. Even in physics, when we talk about particle physics, it all works perfectly if you stay in the realm of particle physics and all the mechanics that work. And then you have, go to astrophysics and on very large scale physics and the rules there all apply. But so far, they're not talking to each other. So we're kind of looking for like a space-time fabric that connects everything together from the very smallest because to our logical thinking well the big things must be made of the smallest things and we believe that atomic structures or subatomic structuring but we don't necessarily know the patterning of it what is the energy grid work so i kind of think i just happened to pull these two props and they might be might be meaningful if, uh, the holy grail right now in spatial geometry because there's a lot of physicists who believe that we are living in a tetrahedral um, universe, that the smallest structure, because the smallest structure we know of is a tetrahedron. So you will get mathematicians and physicists saying, well, this, since a containment field does not get any smaller than this, this must be revealing some really important aspect of our fractaling nature of the universe. The, the mirroring, the as above, so below, the micro revealing the macro and back and forth. And they think that this must be it because it doesn't get smaller. But I was exposed to an artist and he said, 
actually there is a geometric containment container that is smaller and it meets all the criteria of being a geometric solid, meaning it will have points, it will have faces, and it will have edges. What he proposed was this, which is exactly one sixth of a circle, it is exactly the leaf of the, of the seed of life and flower of life, but it's multi dimensional. Oh. And this is the smallest, true smallest ge geometric containment field. It has points, it has surfaces, and it has edges. Now, when you think of the universe, think in terms of this as being an elastic thing that could twist and stretch and compress. And all of a sudden, all the things missing in hard angle geometry, where we know that we need torque and spin and rotation and pulse, this the tetrahedron doesn't do any of those things very well. It mm -hmm. implies that those things could be there, but it doesn't invite them where this shape, imagine it being fluid, kind of gelatin, mm -hmm. it could do all of those things in just in its own form itself. It could twist, it could stretch, it could compress, it could bend. So now all of a sudden you have a geometric model that could contain the holy grail of what we're looking for. And that's fascinating to me. I could, it is. if I can take a moment, um, if you give me a second, I could show you a couple other models if you like seeing those. Yeah, and I do. Cooler. Can I comment on the, because you have that flower of life on the wall behind you. Um, and that is you actually, know, it's, a, it's not the classic flower not, of life. That is a kind of a pineal pattern of equal. So it's not a true, it's not a pineal pattern of a pine cone because it has the same number of arcs going one way as the same number of arcs going the other way. A pineal pattern like in a pine cone would have the golden ratio number. So it would have eight yes. and 13 the other, but okay. this is equal both. So it looks a little more like a chrysanthemum or a, a sunflower seed or something. And certainly because it is curved alludes to sacred geometry because it's feminine curve rather than masculine straight hard edges. But if you do want to talk for a second, I'll show you a couple other models that I think, especially um, Amani, you might really, well, both of you, I think you'll be very interested in. Mm -hmm. Okay. For a second. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that I, I love that you have that representation behind you because it does show how that one um, arc there has the, um, you know, it, it's, it's found, it's in, in several places within that that pattern, you yes. know, and, and I know that that's not exactly the flower of life, but it's similar. And, you know, it just shows how it can be, be found in, in, um, uh, nature, several different mm -hmm. sizes and shapes there. And it, it, and it also, I love it because you can, you know, it's, we're, we're not, even though we feel like we're still on this planet, the planet is in motion. Yes. And it is rotating and revolving. And so there is a spiraling that is happening even when we think that we're still. So I love that because it seems to represent more of or leave more space for the spiraling as opposed to the static. Absolutely. And, also, it, and yeah. it allows for space within space. It sort of allows dark space where... Yeah. Hidden spaces because it twists and turns. Yes. And it seems to me is like it reminds me with what I have studied with what Ibn Arabi again was a, a Gnostic who spoke about how the universe is made of letters. If you think of letters as, you know, uh, kind of strings, it reminds me also with the string theory of how these letters can twist and turn and make shapes. And yeah. these shapes from when they combine together, they can form the uh, elements that we know them and from everything else emerging from that. Right, well, uh, look at this. Look at the technology, uh, the findings that we've seen at CERN, this massive, the world's largest machine by far, the, the CERN Collider. When they are looking for this holy grail of a subatomic you know, article, the God particle, if you want to call it that, firing two protons each other and colliding them each going the speed of light in opposite directions when they take a picture of it more or less everything is arcing out of it there's no straight trajectories out of it every single disper you know disbursement out of it 
is arcing. So and it's, when we go to space, we can't go in a straight line. Can't go straight. We have to go in a curve, which actually the Holy Quran is has a verse that refers to that. It calls it ma'arij, like it has to be curved. It mm. has to be an ascending curve to go to uh, other dimensions, kind of, or to space. Is to go. You have to go in a curve. I love that, um, and it's and it's true that parabolic arch is is really required. Sometimes when I hear in our Bible, you know, Noah and the ark, I I think of instead of a r k as a boat, I think of the significance of the ark. You know, in some cultures, the, a rainbow is called the ark. We have the ark of the covenant. Maybe that ark was an actual conveyance of the significance of an ark. You know, I I wonder about those things. That's just me wondering. Right. Mm -hmm. So if we take um, the, and there is a physicist uh, that was a contemporary of Nikola Tesla, Walter Russell, and he had this quote, all, all trajectory is curve and all line is, is spiral, you know, and like, well, everything around us is straight. What do you, what are you even talking about? But when you understood how he was talking about, and I'll show you in my model that curve and straight line can function together. That's the beauty of it. So Here's, we have our, our little model here, and I love it that it also pulses. You know, it looks like a wave of frequency. And mm -hmm. that's again to me, that this is like a multi-dimensional sound wave. And, you know, when we think of a guitar string vibrating, or we think of it like it looks like on a computer screen. It's flat going up and down. It is not. It is spiraling around right. mm. as well as dipping up and down. So right. it certainly alludes more to that. So. Buckminster Fuller, you maybe both are familiar with Buckminster Fuller and his contributions to math and, and physics. He became almost obsessed with a shape that he called the vector equilibrium that is really the cube octahedron. It has eight triangles and six squares. And it's I don't have the exact model of a, of a vector equilibrium here, but people would be familiar with it if they, if they saw it. And it's a beautiful, he thought it was the geometry of the universe because it does some unique things. It's the first geometric solid that has a true core where every one of its vectors are not only the same length, but they are offset by the same 60 degrees of each other. So as it grows, it grows exponentially of itself. Every, every representation of it, even if it was universal big, there would be a center of it. And like everyone's personal universe would have a center. If you were standing next to another person, your stereoscopic vision, your world, your universe would be slightly different than the person even standing right next to you. From your vo your vanishing point would be a different zero point vanishing point than everybody else's in the world. Mm -hmm. Center each the center of our. Ooh, that's why we have different perspectives. That's because right. We're looking from different angles. About. Exactly right. So what I did with uh, Buckminster Fuller's model is instead of taking these straight vectors, these straight lines from zero point and connecting to a hard angled shape, I took this shape and replaced it. And now we have this unique star pattern. And if I hold it just right, you could sort of see sacred geometry hiding in there, the six petals. But there's 12 of these. So just like in, in you're seeing in the Quran, there's 72 around one. This becomes significant because there's 12 around one. It's actually 13 points required. And I became sort of obsessed with this shape. And if I could skin it, you would see six triangles and you would see, uh, or eight triangles. And then if I can focus, you would see squares. So you would see square yeah. and you would see triangles. Wow. Then I took that model and very quickly assembled it out of pipe cleaners and styrofoam balls because I wanted to see what it would look like. So imagine that I took that star and I don't know if you can see it, but this point right here, you can almost see the six right there. You see that pretty six? Mm -hmm. so that same yes. vector equilibrium matrix. And I let that star structure be the top of a structure that just kept growing and growing and growing. And when I got four levels down, I had no idea that what I would be looking at 
was the flower of life in two dimensions. So mm -hmm. to me, the flower of life has always been a suggestion like a primer in its most elegant, simple, basic way mm -hmm. to get us to look dimensionally. In the movie Contact, I don't know if you've ever saw the movie Contact with Jodie Foster, but yeah, uh, terrestrials were beaming down thousands, tens of thousands of pieces of information looking like pages, and we couldn't decipher them because it seemed like there was a primer needed to put them all together. I think sacred geometry, the simple flower of life, is our primer to this multidimensional aspect that a model I just showed you. Interesting story. Uh, I happen to have one of the world's most famous physicists, Manas Kafatos. He's a Greek physicist. He's a dean of physics here in California. He's written books with Deepak Chopra about physics and spirituality. He looked at this exact model. First, he asked me where I got my physics degree, and I said I never took physics in my life. And he goes, how would you build this model? And I kind of gave him the story. And he goes, this is the most elegant model of the quantum universe I've ever seen. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. <laughs> Wow, it I is impressive it. that you were able to do it by yourself. You did such models by yourself, right? I did, and it was actually very simple. It was it was very it was very easy. All I had to do was remember this shape and mm -hmm. then start as a tetrahedron and then down and down and down. And then it revealed this shape. And then that shape I put at the top and built another one. And and there was sacred geometry waiting for me at the bottom of it. So you can also and I love that. I love it. I've always heard. envisioned. Yeah, it's all yeah. curved, but you can also see plenty of straight lines. You see it. the dimensions, yeah. Yeah, yes. And yes, you can see. And see the hidden it, dimensions when yeah. you see it from a different angle, then yes. the other dimensions are hidden. Right, right. Mm -hmm. right. But I've hopefully... always imagined that the flower of life, though we see it represented in 2D, that it is, it's got to be spherical. And then like, just like everything if you break down or, you know, you continue to buy, uh, what, what, I don't know what the the word is, segment, you know, mm -hmm. all of the, the inner circles with, you know, flowers of life contained within, you know, like microcosmic, that right. it's going to be infinitely, uh, you know, infinitely smaller as well as infinitely larger, you know, it can well, that be was, um, there's representative a of all forms. Yeah, there's a physicist here in California, Nassim Harriman. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Kind of a radical physicist, doesn't have any degrees, but he has a, a huge following and a lot of people uh, that really regard his work highly. And he kind of believes that he's found this holy grail of the quantum universe, the unified field. And it started with the Planck, you know, the smallest thing we, we measure. And it's so subatomically small that it's ridiculously small but it has a value to it. Well, he started thinking of it as a sphere, not a, not a point, but a, its own tiny sphere. And then he scaled that up to bigger spheres that he could get his mind around. And he started modeling these spheres overlapping, not overlapping, touching each other, the, the um, compaction of spheres. And that's what got Buckminster Fuller to this model, to the vector equilibrium. What, Nassim did is like rather than the balls touching the spheres just touching each other on the surface he imagined them overlapping each other and mm -hmm. like soap bubbles overlap they the, you don't see the overlap you see just where the surface meets the surface but when he started doing these models where you could see the overlapping spheres like overlapping bubbles that's when he said that was the thing that ignited his research and got him much closer. So he can scale up now his model of the universe from the smallest to the biggest, and it keeps its scale intact. So potentially he has helped break into that mysterious realm where microphysics, particle physics, quantum physics is now communicating with astrophysics and larger physics. And you know, it's and it's all based on this model and it all incorporates curve and so to me, this model might be really, really significant. Yeah. Uh, it's so interesting. What? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Amani. <laughs> it's interesting you, you're talking about the overlapping and compacting, being compacted together. It just again reminds me with the Quran verses that says how heaven are layered and compacted. So oh. the, the exact words are, are kind of 
used. And uh, I am curious because I'm also got this app that transfer image to students. And uh, I wonder, were you able to get the tunes for the flower of life and uh, other kind of shapes? Can the you notes, the frequencies? The, yeah, the frequency notes for those. Absolutely. I mean, they, and they all repeat. If you look at geometry- So even, they repeat the basic ones. Yes. But is it a flower of life? So it's repeated in a certain way? So like, I would say the, the vector equilibrium sum total is 3,600. Um, that also is in the scale of all these tones that we talk about. Uh, um, you know, instead of 360, it's now by factors of 10 going out to 3,600. Um, so it still seems to elude the, the harmonics. And I call say that we need all three rather than a singular tone. I think it's significant thinking, you know, there's tons of gobbledygook out there on the internet and YouTube and talking about certain frequencies will heal you. A single frequency, 528 is the frequency of your heart or love or something like that. Most scientists will say, hey, there's nothing wrong with 528 hertz, but to say that it's going to do something just by itself, probably not. But when you combine frequencies, when you start combining frequencies, now you have them vibrating against each other. You have cavitation. You have activity, you have generation, you know, you have energy trying to, to do something. That requires multiple frequencies, not just one. So that's the beauty of this geometric universe. It seems like there are three primary frequencies. And in you know the Christian tradition, you think of the Holy Trinity. I often wonder, was that a way of talking about a holy trinity of tones? Mm -hmm. you, you know, there's uh, the song Hallelujah. Leonard Cohen, he says, I heard there was a sacred chord that pleased the Lord. I wonder if that might literally be a thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we, you know, how often do we talk about, throw around the words of living in harmony and what does living in harmony really mean? You know, it, it says everything in nature has a sound. Everything has a vibration and vibration, you know, emits frequency and frequency emits sound, whether we can hear it with our ears or not everything in nature has a sound and we are innately attuned to know when a sound is harmonic and when it is pleasing right you know we we respond to that and that's the the mystery of 432 you know we maybe yeah. back towards the end of the talk here is 432 significant it seems so um all around the world even if it's not western tuning as a circle of fifth middle a right in the middle of the piano is kind of our comfort zone of hearing. You will find many old indigenous instruments that have this A as part of it, vibrating somewhere around that four, it could be as low as 420, as high as 450. And that's where that A oscillated as tuning uh, systems forever. For a while, concert tuning here in the United States was 432. Verdi composed in 432. Um, then it became, all right, Folks, it's time that we're now, it, orchestras are traveling the world. We have to have a, a standard. And at that time, the standard was pitched up a little bit to 440. So that right in the middle of our comfortable hearing range, that A was shifted from eight Hertz from 432 to 440. Well, as soon as you do that, you could argue back and forth, yeah, does it sound better? Is it brighter? Is it vibrating with earth or not? Well, maybe not the part about vibrating with Earth or not, because is when you're in the 440 matrix, all of this information, everything we've talked about, these numbers in myth and religion and religious teachings and spiritual teachings, they all go away. They all don't mean anything anymore to music. But if you drop it down to 432, it's almost like you're inviting the masses into this awareness field. And that's to me far more valuable than just listening to music is all the things it relates to. So I would say that 432, yes, is probably an organic essential frequency in the earth, in ourselves, drop it down 432, 216, 108, 54, 27, you know, it, it, it means something. Those primary tones mean something. And I think we're just beginning to, to really open our minds and eyes 
and we needed the technology. You know, we're, we're the advanced technological species that we are only really where we have these devices of measuring sound and being able to duplicate it and replicate it and measure it by a second. That technology didn't exist 150 years ago. So we're really, we really are like the people that might start breaking the codes of this because we have the technology to do it. Yeah. And I find it very interesting because it is said of, you know, for instance, is said of the Quran that you, you can't, um, you can't take something out of order or out of context because i mean there's there's mathematics and all throughout the and numerology all throughout embedded in the in the it's like you know coded right yeah. it's like coded messages there that you can find and if you take one little thing out of order it changes the code and it seems to me by going from 432 to 440 it changes the code and i know you know it it Sadly, when I was really studying mathematics, I haven't been studying it for many, many years, but when I was really studying it and in, in embedded into it, that I, I was having experience of existing in this geometric realm. And I, you know, I, I had this realization of, wow, if we tweaked one little thing, it would change everything, everything. It would throughout. And, you Absolutely. know, and... And it was like, I could have those experiences of really traveling in that geometric realm. And I've sadly, I've lost that. And I'm hoping to kind of reconnect with that a little bit well, here in this conversation. Just real briefly, there's a whole other conversation, but think, take uh, psilocybin, the psilocybin mm -hmm. fuel, whether it's in found in LSD or mushrooms in its organic form or whatever. And when people ingest that at times, they will see a beautiful matrix unfold in front of their very eyes. They will see the geometry, the fluidity, the lines, the shimmer. They will see all that. Alter that molecule one teeny bit, boom, that, it, none of that happens. None of it. It's be similar, but you're not going to have the same experience. So the way you just you know, expressed it, I think, is exactly right. It needs to be exactly right and that's to me a bit of a tragedy in music all over the world or at least in western music we don't our music is not mathematically perfect the only numbers on in hertz cycles on a standard keyboard would be a and it's octaves octave down from 440 would be 220 down an octave would be 110 up an octave would be 880 those are the only pure numbers you will see on a piano as soon as you get to any other frequency to sound okay and blend okay to our ears, they've all been tweaked a little bit and they're all just off and they all have decimal points going out sometimes to looks like infinity. It is not the pure mathematical ratios as revealed by nature. So I think we've actually robbed ourselves of hearing these mathematical perfectly tones revealed in nature's patterning and designs. We don't hear it. We don't get to, if you haven't seen my sonic geometry videos, possibly the only time you've heard mathematically perfect uh, harmonics is right now. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting is that uh, sometimes when we hear something that is called sacred music, it's a little different than the regular music. Right. So there is something there. And I also, I'm not a musician. I don't have much knowledge, but I know that there are different scales also in the Eastern world uh, than the Western music. So it seems to me there is something there about the secret of knowing these frequencies and, and feeling them and being in harmony with them. Absolutely. And I would, um, I'm not very familiar with teachings of the Quran, but it sounds like Muhammad was actually receiving some really important geometric information, you know, codes and clues about how the universe works. And I would ask if you could, if after our conversation, uh, that you could make notations of the ones that you think are significant or, and then email them to me, I would love to, to read those. Sure, sure. We've been uh, exploring this area, me and Mastura, in our class, uh, the Ocean of Sound, which is we are making this summit and interviewing different people from different fields and different 
religious background and spiritual background to see what uh, what are their views so we can yeah. integrate the knowledge and 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 together uh, enrich each other yes. so we'll be happy to share that with you. I, I would love to do that i think jesus probably got some of of that information when he says you Definitely. know is in heaven to me that is the micro revealing the macro the macro revealing the micro that's a very much of a, a quantum physics you know idea the similarity also that you know the bible say uh, the world was created from the world and yeah. the, world is, the, sound. the world is a vibration and yes. in the Quran it says the world is created from the word be yeah. the word be which means existence itself so existence itself is a vibration yeah. uh, from you know the ultimate real uh, or yes. what we call god so it's all came yeah. as a vibration from yeah. that. You could, we call it a mic drop here in the, the States. When you say something really profound, existence is a vibration. That's your mic drop. <laughs> yeah. And even in the word for be in Arabic is kun, which the, is the, like this, um, you know, has the, the uh, associated with the creator and the nun is associated with the creation. Mm. And it's like the, with is embodied within the noon and the the noon you know is is of the creator so you know the it's the creator it, it that all of the creation is of the creator and you know it is there is there is not a separation right and you and know at it, kind it, of the circle which is the basic of the sacred geometry is a circle and uh, that is how uh, we go in a cycle in life from yes. the invisible to the visible and then from the visible to the invisible when we die yes, so right. it's, everything is like uh, has this uh, geometrical uh, motion As to it aspect to it yes motion yes. or aspect to it yes yes i agree and that's I encoded agree. in the shape of the letters also when you study the shape of the letters mm -hmm. of the you know the visible and the invisible and that and the dot, you know, and uh, the representation um, in the shapes as well. And again, found in nature, found in the cosmos, found in the body. You yeah. know, there's that. They uh, it's, it says if you to read three books, if you really want to 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 understand, to read three books. The three books being the cosmos, the body, and the Quran, where there's just so much encoded. Mm. And it uh, seems like the knowledge was lost in the past, this kind of knowledge uh, that the ancient civilization had and got lost, then it is kind of awakening again or maybe not lost, maybe, maybe not lost, maybe hijacked, maybe kept secret. Ah, interesting. When mm -hmm. we talk about secret societies, it wasn't lost, it was wanting to be kept just for a very few people because this truly does almost open up where you could think of yourself as being godlike. And if you just want to think I've got all the information, let's keep everybody else in the dark, you could you could do that with this information. So I, I imagine it's, it's yeah, because when they went the pyramids, everything in it was taken. Yeah. Uh, and there is this tunnel, uh, the super, what it's called, Seraperium in Egypt, yeah. uh, that is tunnels it was full of information was also taken so uh, nobody knows where it is now probably the vatican <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, well it was it's a very interesting topic uh, and we're, we're very happy that you shared with us your knowledge and we well, if i if, if i had known both both of your pedigrees i might have been a little more intim intimidated <laughs> to come on <laughs> No, not at all. Not, I mean, I, I, yeah, not at all, because I feel like, like Manny said, we all bring our information together. We can learn more from each right. other. And hopefully, and I know that I have a lot more to learn from you. And I have watched your videos on your website, on your sonicgeometry.com. I'll go ahead and throw that out there, sonicgeometry.com. Fascinating videos there. And I've also then explored more on YouTube. And, you know, it, 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 it's, Oh, fascinating information. And just so, you know, one of the things that you said, you're probably the least likely guy to, for this information to come through the prophet Muhammad alayhi salam was, you know, he, he was illiterate. 
and yet the entire Quran was downloaded through him. Yeah. And so, you know, there is that, um, I think perhaps a, an element of, of credibility that comes through when you're not the likely guy who's been out there looking for the information. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh, so, when I, um, yeah, you can relate I, to that. <laughs> I can relate to that in a my, very literal way. These guides kind of, I call them my guides, I don't know, but they kind of dropped in a few years later and said, well, you were always our least likely to succeed, but here, you, here you're the one kind of promoting it. So <laughs> good job to the degree that you could do it. I think you did uh, amazing work to be able to create this model. It's really fascinating. So thanks for sharing that with us. If you want to wrap up with just any words of wisdom for those who want to continue study um, or to learn more. Or well, you know, you could study the people that I've said, Buckminster Fuller uh, really was tapped into something like this. People like Alan Watts, philosophers, um, you know, that kind of came away with a geometric awareness. Um, R Walter Russell, these are people in the 1800s, 1900s, late 1800s, early 1900s, um, that had a certain awareness come through them and could convey it in modern language unlike Muhammad or Jesus or people, you know, they use the language as best as they could alluding to things, but certain concepts might be very hard to, to convey in the language of the day or the thinking of the day. So, uh, you know, everything is connected. Ultimately, the message is everything is connected and the way you said it, Emini, or, uh, Emini you know, existence is vibration or is, is that what you said? Vibration is existence? That's it. I mean, and we're all affecting our vibration is affecting everyone else's vibration. Every, every thing's vibration is affecting every other thing's vibration. And when you drop into that field of awareness and think that everything you think, say, and do matters vibrationally to the vibration in the entire field, you start living a little more consciously, I believe. Mm, I love that. Thank, love you. That. thank you so much. So for, thank you so much. That. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you both. And keep me posted on both of you if you think there's particular teachings or verses in the Quran that apply to what this conversation we've been having. I would love to read them. Yeah, beautiful. And maybe the works of Ibn Arabi. So we can send yeah. you some information on that as well. Absolutely. I'm still I'm still researching. I'm still on my journey. <laughs> yeah. We are all in the right? journey of researching yeah. and discovering. Yep. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you yes. so much. Thank okay, you. thank you so much. And for those of you listening, stay tuned for more information from the Ocean of Sound.